I thought I should give it a, an exciting artsy title. <laughs> Search of the Mysterious Butterflies of the Soul. But of course, this is a quote from the grandfather of neuroanatomy, the great Ramon y Cajal. Like the entomologist in pursuit of brightly colored butterflies, this is my little brightly colored butterfly here, in the shape of a, of a brain, my attention hunted in the flower garden of the gray matter, cells with delicate, elegant forms, the mysterious butterflies of the soul, the beating whose wings may someday, who knows, clarify the secrets of mental life. This is from his memoirs, Recollections of My Life from 1923 highlighting perhaps one of the greatest research projects our species will, will ever undertake. Now, as, as scientific understanding develops, as we slowly learn more about brain function in, in relation to behavior, artists too are asking, what is the significance of this understanding to the way we see ourselves as embodied, situated minds? In that scientists correlate brain activity with behavior, artists want to correlate this understanding with their own experiences of the world. And it's not just artists, it's, it's us too. So let's start with uh, a quote from Anka, the, the artist's prerogative. Scientific images or icons can be liberated from their context and incorporated into works of art that explore through metaphor, novel poetic possibilities and associations. Artists are not bound by the logical thinking inherent in science, so artists are free to manipulate scientific icons. Now, of course, these are novel poetic possibilities that were not lost on, on Cajal. And artists can go beyond this. It's not just about manipulating scientific icons. It's about taking control of the whole, the whole of scientific practice, whether you're dealing with ideas, hy hypotheses, data, machinery, ways of actually running experiments. There's an, an enormous scope here. It's also true that artists may not be bound by the logical thinking inherent in science, but Many of them are open to the framework science offers as a way of understanding knowledge, producing meaning. So what I want to do now is just take you through, um, very quickly, three tiny snapshots of how artists are exploring these poetic possibilities. And I want to suggest that in many ways, in contemporary artistic practice, artists are becoming uh, increasingly sophisticated and clever about the relationship to scientific heritage and producing some, some very interesting work, I think. I hope you'll see that in many ways, the way of thinking between scientists and artists is, is really not that different. And some of, of these works show that. So my three arbitrary groups. Uh, the first one is the self-portrait. With the discussion surrounding the neural and genetic correlates of, of, of human behavior, whether we're talking about the neural um, networks behind aesthetic decision-making about the genetic neural basis of mental illness, depression. We've heard a lot about that today. Science does challenge our sense of, of identity, our sense of, of, of who we are. Um, artists often ask, are scientific measures of human behavior and function any better descriptors of self than artists normally em employ, for, for example, in a, in a normal portrait? Um, how does scientific knowledge change the way we understand us as unique individuals in, in comparison to us as a collective group? And I think, it, in a way very much related to the, the, the earlier talk today, there is a, um, that there are, there's a fear amongst many that um, scientific knowledge may take over. Instead of trying to understand what causes depression as we grow up through, through, through education, through our life experiences, is there a real risk of a dystopian vision where we can just simply treat it with deep brain stimulation. Who knows? But these are concerns that um, provide artists with, with fantastic material to explore. Now, although a lot of, probably the most, uh, some of the most exciting work in the realm of art dealing with these issues actually comes from molecular biology, with the sequencing of the human genome, you can imagine this, this, this has produced uh, a, a a fantastic material to play with. But in the neurosciences as well, we see these developments. So I'll, I'll just take you through a few, a few example works. This is a very early work from Robert Morris from 63. Um, whilst concentrating on his identity, he has a, a series of multi-channel EEG recordings made to the length equal to, to his height. And he's asking essentially, is this a better description of who he is as a, a, a 
unique individual. This, is, this describes large population brain activity from, from multiple sites over time. It's a sort of portrait in time, if you like. But can you reduce someone to an EEG? Valid question. Moving on to the late, great, controversial Helen Chadwick, sub-portrait from 91. If you can't see it, the contrast isn't very good. She's, she's holding her own brain. In a way, what she offers us is a, is a post-racial view of, of the individual, independent of gender, race. Our brains look, in this way, essentially similar. It's almost a, a collective self-portrait. And it's interesting to see, actually, that, that the, the best indicator of her identity comes from her hands, every blemish on, on, on every finger, on every nail. But also, as we have commented, because the brain reconstructs our visual world, and this is what we see, uh, in a way, if we look at this, it is our brains looking at themselves, made particularly uh, strange by the fact that she is holding, in theory, her own, her own brain. Moving on to Susan Oldworth. She had a series of ephem fMRI scans made. Um, and what she offers us really is, is a vision of what brain imaging might, might give us if it could capture imagination, if it could capture our, our very, the content of our very thoughts, our very opinions. So she, she takes these fMRI images and she inscribes on them uh, scenes and images from her, her, her daily experiences, things which she feels really define herself. But with the words, and I have to refer to my notes here, um, Accompanying the images, I am both in my mind and out of my brain. You can look into my brain, but you will never find me. Now, this is a very telling quote. It reveals, it really just scratches the surface of the fact that artists are fighting with, on one side, an admiration for what contemporary brain sciences can show, but a deep scepticism regarding what they can actually reveal. You can look into my brain, but you won't find me. You will simply find blobs correlating in some way which we don't fully understand to specific behaviors but not Susan Oldworth. Now this skepticism is, is taken is expressed in a particularly wonderful way. Ah we have no sound that just occurred to me. Okay you won't hear it but I'm sure you all know the tune The Writer Spring Stravinsky. This is a wonderfully irreverent work from Margulies and Chris Sharp untitled 2009 with a subtitle the effect of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and Kant's third critique of the human brain, a functional magnetic resonance imaging account. Now, the third critique is the judgment of, of taste. It's one of the foundational do uh, documents, along with Baumgarten, for our understanding of the aesthetic. And this is, this is becoming vogue in neuroscience at the moment. He gets a subject to read the critique, puts them in a brain scanner, plays the Rite of Spring, and asks them to think about the work. And we want to understand it. It's mesmerizing. We want to correlate every change in color, every change in activity with what's happening in the music. Of course you can't. It's impossible. This is, this is the unreducible un, un, um, human brain at, at work. And I think it's, it's a wonderful comment on the dangers of uh, brain imaging studies if they're done incorrectly, if we overinterpret what we see. It's a lovely idea. Um, I don't have the, the whole piece, unfortunately, but... So let's move on to my second arbitrary group, the scientific portrait. Many artists are very happy to and excited to engage with scientific research in more in its own terms, to try to understand what it is it is trying to say, but use artistic practice as a way of creating these poetic possibilities. This isn't data visualisation. This really is a portrait of scientific practice. So where else could I start apart from Pablo Garcia Lopez? He's a former neuroscientist and a Cajal scholar. So here we have our pet soul butterflies. Uh, it's, it's a painting taken from a pet scan, but with these wonderful butterflies imposed on top. It's quite a beguiling work. You don't see the uh, butterflies at first. It feels like a normal pet image. And then suddenly these butterflies emerge at, uh, out of nowhere. It's rather lovely. Um, we have the, the ongoing work from Andrew Carney, Magic Forest, 2002, and Complex Brain. 
these are video installations that come from a long-standing relationship he's had with Dr. Richard Wingate uh, at the Medical Research Council Center for um, Developmental Neurobiology at King's College. Please, I remember that. Um, he's, for many years, he's been engaged in this research, doing some of, of the, uh, the research himself, and he, he really wants to find a way of, of uh, uh, bringing across the majesty of cortical organization. Uh, on the left, Magic Forest, the way this is built, it's a series of transparent screens. They can be many meters in length, many meters in height, spaced at around a foot apart and lit from projectors on, on both sides. So as you stand in front of this, you really get an impression of, of, of cortical complexity receding into a, a sort of infinite distance. It's, it's quite a wonderful work. And from my own developing practice, the, uh, the memory tower. This is a, a full immersion virtual reality installation uh, based at, at Duke University in North Carolina. This, this is a three by three meter, three by three by three meter virtual reality theater cube, essentially. It's virtual reality on all sides. So you have this full immersion in this virtual world. The installation is about three kilometers by three kilometers um, and uses architecture as a, a visual metaphor for the content and structure of memories. This, this is building in about 60 years worth of research regarding how memories during sleep are replayed and, and strengthened. But through architecture, um, I'm trying to build in, again, this cultural collective aspect of, of human, human experience. This normally takes me hours to explain, so I will leave it at that. <laughs> um, a, a few recent images from uh, a couple of colleagues exploring it in the theatre. So let's move on to the final category, new creative possibilities. There is a bit of a mini revolution occurring on within contemporary art. As the, the research protocols, the, the research equipment of scientific practice is becoming um, more accessible in terms of art science collaborations, it's becoming commercially more, more viable to, to set up on a massive scale. Artists are beginning to engage in a very different way with scientific practice, going beyond ta taking imagery, taking ideas, and actually trying to run scientific experiments for artistic purposes. So I want to take you through two rather lovely works. Ah, the whole rat hand side has vanished. Okay, that's fine. I'll explain it. So fragmented orchestra from a group based around John Matthias. He wanted to see how can you use a simulation of a neural network to create a completely spontaneous, unreproducible sound landscape. He's, he's an, an Emmy award-winning musician by, by training, and a physicist, of course. So uh, there were 24 sound boxes placed at different sites in the UK. You'll see that Scotland is still part of the UK. Not sure how long that will last, but for the moment, there it is. Um, and at each of these sites, public, the public can, can come to these sound, sound boxes and uh, uh, do whatever they want. Some are placed beside the organs of great cathedrals. Some are, are placed beside uh, the, uh, uh, the dining tables in, in primary schools. There's continuous sound activity going on 24 hours a day from these 24 sites within the UK. All of this information is fed to the fact gallery in Liverpool and processed within a neural network. So I'll just quickly explain very briefly how that goes. So we have our 24 individual sites. It's fed into a simulation of a network based on the Ishakevich model. It's only 24 neurons. It's a tiny, tiny neural network. Each neuron corresponds to one sound box. But they're connected in a very particular fashion with a mixture of, of, um, uh, of, of, of different excitatory cell types. And basically, when the sound level reaches a, a certain threshold at that sound box, it'll make that cell fire. And when that cell fires an action potential, it'll spread through the network and may activate other cells according to what other excitatory input is going on at that time. So you end up with a pattern of neural activity in time. This is fed into a granular sam sampler, which replaces each action potential with a snippet of sound, a granule of sound, which comes from the original site. So you end up with a very complicated la sound landscape, which could never be predicted uh, based on what's happening at those original sites. This is then 
fed back to the gallery and fed back to those original 24 sites. So as people input into these boxes, they can also hear what the collective behavior is. Now, I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment, but I'll just show you the, the second work first. Of course, the question comes, why use a simulation of a neural network? Why not actually use a real neural network? And this is where Symbiotica, in a, a, a group at the University of Western Australia, really pioneers in, in wet biology art, uh, rise to the fore. So in collaboration with Steve Potter at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, they've built this, this system. I can imagine that I have a, no, maybe not. <laughs> See fights from behind the curtain. Which one? Ah, uh, that one. See fight, okay. So just to make some sort of entrance into the diagram, um, there's a, a, a camera which takes an image of a particular site. You might have someone lying there, you might have an animal running past, could be anything. This is pixelized into a, 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 um, um, an, an eight by eight grid, 64 pixels, fed online across to the States, where it's used to stimulate this, this, this multiple electrode array. This is a set of 64 electrodes with cultured um, cells from rodent brains on top of it. So these are, these are culture cells which have grown together and formed some, some kind of random network. It's, it's, it's a functioning living neural network, essentially. So you have this pattern of stimulation based on the image taken in Australia projected onto the network. This s drives activity. So here, white is very active, black is silent. And they're able to create from this um, a, a population vector, essentially. So. If you start at the center, most activity is up there, so you, so you can create this, this, this vector. This vector is fed back to Australia and used to drive a mechanical arm that draws on the, onto the sheet of paper which is being photographed here. So you have this closed loop system. So as it draws, it updates the input which is fed back to uh, the, the, the states and so on and, and so on. And I uh, have a quote from so it's me art, it's, it, it's, it's multi-electrode array art, me art. This is from Oren Katz. Biology is evolving from a phase of discovery into a phase of creativity and utilization. The effects on society will be profound. Hands-on wet biological art is starting to be seen as valid means of expressing cultural and artistic perceptions, as well as exploring neglected areas in biological research. It explores the nature of contestable futures that may arise. The cybernetic notion of interfacing neurons with machines, robots, is starting to become a reality. And Bill has already talked about these cochlear implants and so on. Now, I've, having spoken with these two groups, there is no consensus on why one is doing this. <laughs> and it's fascinating to, to see from Oren Katz's perspective, as he said to me in a not necessarily aggressive tone, but art is about meaning making, not about knowledge making. There is, uh, this is a very complicated statement which would take longer to, to, to unravel, but there is a feeling amongst many that to <coughs> actually tie <coughs> this artistic practice towards scientific research would be insulting to the artist. It's about having to make compromises for an entirely different system of knowledge, the, the scientific method. But not everyone feels like this. The, the creator of um, Fragmented Orchestra is very interested in, in how we may learn about neural networks through this type of spontaneous simulation running. And he's collected data from this artwork, and he's now collaborating with scientists to find out how this reveals unique properties of this network. So this comes to my main point. I hope I have time, five minutes? About five minutes. Hmm? Three. Three. I'll just have to speak very quickly. Fine. <laughs> so this, this raises, rises, raises the issue of performativity in scientific practice. Now, performativity is an issue that's long been discussed in the arts and, and humanities, um, whether it's philosophical linguistics, queer theory, gender studies, performance theory, you name it. There is a long heritage of discussing notions of the performative. Now, one concept associated with it that is emerging is the value of essentially a non-propositional logic of understanding, the embodied experience of doing. 
and associated with that, tacit knowledge, implicit knowledge, heuristics, intuition. Now, from a scientific point of view, I don't think any scientist would argue that this type of embodied understanding does not play a role in, in, our, um, in, in, in the way discoveries are made. The scientific method isn't just an execution of clearly defined rules. No robot could perform science. It requires a human creative thinking mind. Now, in terms of how um, an understanding of the performative is related to the act of discovery, artists are asking whether we can, we can expand this. Fragmented orchestra, me art, in many ways could, could contribute to the way we, we explore simulations of neural networks and, and how we discover complex behaviours amongst them. But Hans Diepner, who is the student of Otto Rusler, who Bill was talking about before, has a new vision, one that, that goes one step further. He is a chaos physicist by, by training, and his, his argument is, is that certain, certain systems are either too complex to actually quantify, or the, the quantifications we have of them are insufficient. So, chaos systems in particular, but also complex neural networks. And he asks a very simple question. If it's too complex to reduce to figures, graphs, some kind of quantified measure, why not have essentially an installation, an art installation of these simulations as the end product of a period of research? And this is, this is one example of such uh, an installation. This is a neural network. Um, each pixel is a cell, and it's exploring this... I hope this isn't me, no. Uh, <laughs> where is my phone? No, it's fine, it's fine. Um, this is exploring how, when you excite part of a network, this, excite, this point of excitation can spread as a wave through that network, as a sort of inhibitory, excitatory couple. The white are um, moments of excitation, the dark green inhibition. So essentially, these are snapshots in time, so you can see the wave spreading. There's virtually no way you could describe this in a useful way in a paper, but to actually have this as an installation, as a public installation, where people can, can spontaneously interact with it, and spontaneously really is, is key here, just see what happens when they, they play with it, he argues you will reveal more about what this network can do and what it can't do than you would ever get in the normal way this would be studied in a scientific research setting. And from my experience of neural network studies uh, uh, in the university where I did my PhD, I've, I feel this is certainly the case. There are very, very restricted ways in which these networks are often tested. A couple of pictures from uh, the installation uh, piece there in, in Budapest. So, with 10 seconds, haha, to go, I've, I've ever run, I have a small conclusion. So, just as scientists are continually in search for new methods, artists, too, want to explore new ways of understanding our lived reality. So, as the interface between society, science, and technology becomes more wrought, with ubiquitous machines with cochlear implants, and so on and so on, new points of crossover are emerging between more traditional aspects of artistic and scientific practice. Now, the question is, what will emerge out of this? And it may be that, that what will emerge is a very different understanding of these practices and a different understanding of how one inquires into the world. It's about putting artistic practice and scientific practice almost on an equal footing, which is really quite a radical thought. This is, this is something we have not seen since before the Age of Enlightenment. And that's quite exciting. Thank you. <laughs>